Genesis chapter 38 is where you can turn your Bible today. And I will begin by saying, I can guarantee you the Bible is inspired by God, unlike any other book. You know why? Because if it wasn't, if this book was written by men, like people like to say, this chapter would never have made it into the Bible. <laughs> guarantee you. Because uh, we human beings don't put stuff in that we don't, uh, we don't want people to know about us. Uh, we do not deliberately air our dirty laundry, so to speak. And that's basically what uh, this is. This is Jacob's family's dirty laundry right in our face here. There's a couple of chapters in the Bible, and don't look now, but Judges 19, the, the Levite and his concubine, is another chapter that I do not enjoy reading, let alone preaching on. In fact, I... After I have put together my thoughts, I look at commentaries, and one of the commentaries that I always look at when I prepare uh, our messages from the book of Genesis is a book by Dr. H.C. Leupold, and uh, in the back of his uh, each chapter, he has a, a what he calls a, a homiletical suggestions or suggestions for preaching. Well, he only had one sentence at the end of chapter 38. You know what he said? Quote, entirely unsuited to homiletical use. <laughs> Unquote. In other words, don't ever preach from this. Read it. Get from it. Glean from it what you can. Don't ever preach from Genesis 38. Well, I'm going to disagree with him today. Okay, and uh, we are going to look at this, this passage, not in great detail, but uh, as the Lord has uh, led us to. And you know, if you're familiar with the story of Yehuda, Judah, and Tamar, in the, in the Greek language, Judah is, get this, Judas. different one, of course. Not a good name by the time you get to the New Testament. But anyhow, uh, anyway, what I want to say is you can read a chapter like this and you can really feel pretty self-righteous, can't you? Whoa! This guy was really bad. This, oh, how could they? Well, before we get too uppity, in our spirituality, I think we need to be honest with ourselves. And we need to simply realize that I don't care who we are, how long we've been saved, how spiritual we may think that we are. In our flesh, we are capable of the same kind of stuff. Now listen, I, uh, it, it may not ever be in uh, an act that we do, but in our thought life. Anyone here care to have your thought life projected up here on the screens? I don't want mine. So let's not get too self-righteous about what we read here and what we study here in chapter 38. Chapter 37 to the end of the book which is chapter 50, is a history of Jacob's family. We noted that in verse 2 of chapter 37 last week. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. And the first name given is then Joseph. And chapter 38, where we are this morning, is essentially for the development of the flow of the rest of the book of Genesis. Chapter 37 explains how Joseph and eventually Jacob's whole family end up in Egypt. Chapter 38, if you think about it, is why they had to sojourn in Egypt. They had some things to learn. And in chapter 38, it really provides the backdrop for the 
wonderful purity that you see played out in chapter 39 in the refusal of Joseph to be involved in adultery or fornication. In chapter 38, there are also, I think, some of the consequences that Judah suffered for selling his brother Joseph as he did. And in chapter 39, I think in the chapters following, you have a description of the price that Joseph paid for his brother's sins against him. Now, when I think of Joseph's family, or Jacob's family, I should say, I am sure that some of these family members had a realization of the divine destiny that uh, was wrapped up in that family. The covenant was originally given to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. He passed it on to Isaac. Isaac passed it on to Jacob. And I'm sure that Jacob talked about it to his 12 sons and his family. So some of Jacob's sons must have had a sense of the divine destiny of the family that they were a part of. But regardless of that, they were willing to let the world infiltrate and they were willing to personally participate in cultural norms by marrying unbelievers, by mixed marriages, intermarriage, and by adopting some pagan ways of life, which, of course, threatened to destroy the whole line of Jacob. There is an interesting verse, I'm just going to throw it out, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Don't look there, but listen. Basically, here's what it says. Bad company corrupts. Bad company corrupts. And in chapter 38, we have revealed to us the danger of an invasion of current thinking, popular thinking, and current uh, actions or activity, uh, invading and, of course, uh, dominating a family, making it so that the family that was supposed to be distinct from the other families on the earth had little difference to show for it and nullified that God-intended distinction that God's people should have as different from everyone else in the right sense. Well, chapter 38, I think, brings it all down on a personal level and it reveals the underbelly of our human nature. The ugliness of a life that begins to be focused upon, upon ourselves. A life that, uh, that is self-centered, that is centered around satisfying ourselves. Warning, we're all prone to that kind of a life. That's our tendency, and we have to be honest about that. And so one of the things that I would point out as we begin this morning is what I see in the first 10 verses is what could be called self-willed. Self-willed Judah and self-willed sons that he produced. Self-willed. Before we go any further, we need to pray. We really need to pray and ask you, Heavenly Father, to, through your Spirit, guide us into all truth. I pray that you'll use this. I don't know how to describe this chapter. In human Viewpoint, seedy, ugly, nasty. And yet, Spirit of God, you chose to include it in our Bible. And you said that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable in one of four ways, or perhaps in all four ways. But we just pray today that you would use this chapter in a profitable way in our lives. We want Jesus to be magnified. He alone can deal with this kind of stuff that is prone and tendency in our own life. 
Help us to be honest about ourselves mm -hmm. and not uh, merely point out the defects in others, be it Judah and his sons and his daughter-in-law or whoever, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So you have a very self-willed uh, portion here in the first 10 verses. You, you have extreme rebellious behavior. You have... Uh, you have people that are de defying God, obviously, but you have people that are defying their authorities, their parental authorities, and um, even their own better judgment, and they're doing it for their own pleasure. They're doing it to satisfy themselves. They're doing it because they want to. And the first five verses, this self-will is seen in, if I can use just one word, assimilation. They're assimilating into the culture. Look at it. In uh, verse uh, 1, it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adjulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet conceived again and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at uh, Kizib when she bare him. That's the first five verses that uh, we've quickly read. What's going on here is assimilation. What's happening here is there is an intermarriage of Judah with a lost woman, a Canaanite woman, a pagan woman, an unbelieving woman. You have the intermarriage of Judah, but not only him, but his sons follow his example. And so you have an obvious breakdown of clear, clearly defined lines of separation. You have marriage to lost people going on, believers marrying lost people, ignoring God's will and compromising with the world, really, to simply get what they wanted in life. That's really what assimilation is all about in the spiritual and moral realm. It's just doing whatever you want to do in order to get what you want in life. And I want to say something to the young people here today. I want to say that uh, there are two main things that uh, determine who you will be in 10 years from now. The first thing is what you are looking at and what you're listening to on a regular basis. What you're looking at and what you're listening to on a regular basis will determine what you are 10 years from now and also who you hang out with, who you are hanging out with and who you'll marry eventually. All of this figures into who you will be 10 years from now. This pressure of assimilation is, it's crucial. It's called peer pressure that causes people to assimilate into a worldly, ungodly, and really pagan culture. We have a neo-paganism that has taken over our nation. And the pressure is on. So there's, first of all, in this self-will, there is assimilation. But in verses 6 and 7, look at it. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Second part of being self-willed is not only assimilation, but to help you remember it, all my words will have an, an ION on the end of it, transgression, these two verses. And it's unspecified what his sin or his transgression is. But obviously, whatever Ur did, whatever the transgression was, he was an extremely immoral man for God to have to take him out like this. And it simply is evidence of the family steep moral slide, that there are consequences when, when fathers and mothers and families make wrong choices. There are big consequences to that. 
The third thing that really brings out the self-willed part of this chapter is, uh, I would simply jump back to verse 2, Judah saw, he saw, and he took and went in unto her. Those verbs, saw, took, went in unto her. And then if you'll drop down with me, verses 8 to 10, and Judah said unto Onan, go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass that when he went unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Self-willed involves assimilation, it involves transgression, and here, gratification. Judah is the prime example and the first one here of gratification. He saw, he took, he went in under her. In other words, he took what he wanted. He saw something, he didn't care whether this one was a believer or an unbeliever. He wanted her. It was probably, initially, simply a look of lust because it seems like it was all focused on the outward appearance of this Canaanite woman, who is unnamed. We only know her father's name. We don't even know her name. But also, there is gratification, and I'm thinking self-willed, so self-gratification, not only in Judah, but wouldn't you imagine that if it was in dad, it's going to be in his son? And that's what we see here in Onan. In that uh, verse uh, 9, where it says, when he went in unto his brother's wife, the word when could better be translated, perhaps, whenever. In other words, it was not just a one-time act, but she, uh, he was married to her, and so... He went in unto her many times, but the bottom line is this. He took advantage of the situation. You see, here is how it was supposed to work. In Near Eastern culture, and then it got codified uh, in uh, the Mosaic Law in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's detail about what's going, uh, about uh, what is called leveret marriage. Leveret marriage, levere from the Latin word uh, husband's brother, Leveret marriage was simply this, it was custom, it was practice, that if a man died before he could uh, have children, it was the responsibility of his brother then to marry his widow and to produce children for his brother, especially if his, uh, the brother that uh, would marry the widow would be unmarried of course, as uh, Onan was here. And so what we see here is that he is not really honoring that. In fact, he's simply taking personal advantage for sexual gratification, but refusing to take on the responsibility that went with it to raise up a family in the line of his brother who God killed. And the reason he refused to give his uh, brother's widow children is simply because he was greedy. He was selfish because Ur was the firstborn. His older brother was the firstborn and had the birthright. And if he would raise up children for his brother, then they would get the birthright, his brother's child, instead of him who would be next in line. So you have to see here that this is gratification going on here. It's greed gratification that's taking place here in this uh, self-willed action that, is, that was taken by Judah and now by his son Onan. 
There's a second thing that I would uh, hasten to bring to your attention in verses 11 to 23 self-willed, and now I call it two-faced. It's deception. It's uh, pretending to do something or be something when really not at all. And it's not surprising that uh, there is some two-facedness going on because uh, it's a leading family characteristic. Haven't we found that out in Jacob's line? But first of all, look at verse 11. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now there's two-facedness going on on uh, the part of Judah to begin with. And it is really because of his superstition. From what we can read in this 11th verse, it appears to me that uh, Judah considered Tamar to be cursed, to be very bad luck, because he had married off two, uh, two sons to this woman, and both of them got killed by God. So she's cursed. She's jinxed. Uh, I'm not going to give her another one of my son, uh, my last remaining son, and see him die too. So he doesn't really intend to do what he says he uh, will do in verse 11. And uh, Tamar, she would be officially regarded as Shelah's wife even though they hadn't consummated the marriage, she would be considered his wife. But it never got consummated because Judah never followed through and did what he said he would. And by the way, the boys would get married early in life, like 15 years of age. Okay, so uh, give you a little bit of the time frame that we're talking about here. She waited some time, but it didn't happen. Two-faced because of superstitious, the superstition of Judah, but also, as we get on in this chapter, in verses 12 through 23, the rest of that section, you see that Tamar is two-faced as well. She is very clever. There is calculation on her part, superstition on his part, calculation on her part. Tamar focuses on her right to be married to Judah's firstborn. And that would have been, at that point, Shelah. And so she's determined to secure a child, and in doing so, she's willing to risk one chance in a hundred by taking this clever scheme of hers to take full advantage of the situation. Very risky what she did, but it was, it was important to her to be the mother of the firstborn, that there's rights that go with the birthright, right? And look at the occasion, verse 12, first of all. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted. And he went up unto his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend, Hira the Angelamite. Okay? So what's going on here? The occasion, I want you to see, is it's sheep shearing season. It's sheep shearing time, and sheep shearing time was party time. There was a lot of feasting, and with feasting there was drinking that would go on. There was lightheartedness that is always a part of festivities. And it was a time, of course, when people would let their guard down. It was a time, of course, of, uh, of sexual temptation, which would be strong because it was in the territory of the Canaanites, and Canaanite religion encouraged certain forms of ritual prostitution and fornication to enhance, they felt, fertility. And so that's all part of this occasion. You have to understand, she's clever. 
she sees this. This is a great setup. This is a, a great occasion for her to take advantage of. And verse 13 says, It was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. Ah, sheep shearing time. Party time. And he's going to be a part of it. Aha! And I know his reputation to a certain degree anyway. He's a widower, and, uh, you know, a widower uh, perhaps is, in a peculiar way, more susceptible to sexual temptation. And he's certainly not known for being morally pure. He married a Canaanite woman that he saw. So, hmm... Perhaps she knew that this wasn't the first time that he had uh, hooked up in the way that she's going to arrange for him. She knew his reputation, and this was a great occasion. Look at verse 14. And she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. Look at how she, look at the position here, how she positions herself. She placed herself in a, in a very strategic uh, spot. And by the way, in verse 21 and verse 22, there is two uses of the word harlot which she pretended to be. And the word harlot that is used in verse 21 and 22 is very important to understand. It means a cultural prostitute. It means a, it, it, it means a cult prostitute, I mean, not cultural. A cult prostitute, which links her with the ritual, religious ritual of the Canaanites. That she was one of them. That's how she posed herself, how she positioned herself, and she put herself at a spot where that trade was normally practiced or plied. The occasion, the reputation, the position, and then look at the rest of the story. In verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, Well, what wilt thou give me, that thou mayest to come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till you send it? And he said, Well, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, How about your signet? Now a signet was a a uh, it was it was like his uh, his master card. Okay, it was a a, uh, a cord or string around the neck that had either a ring or a uh, a uh, cylindrical uh, piece of pottery, but on the end of it it had his stamp, his personal stamp uh, that could uh, that would identify him by that particular stamp, whatever it was. Give me your signet, she says, uh, in that uh, 17th verse, or 18th verse. And your bracelets, uh, uh, your, your jewelry, and the staff that's in your hand, your, your shepherd's staff, your rod. She asked for those things as a pledge. And so he did that, and he gave it to her and uh, went in unto her, and she conceived by him, and she arose and went away, laid aside her veil from her, put back on her widow's garments. Verse 20, And Judah sent the kid by the hand of the friend, uh, the Agilmite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he couldn't find her. And then he asked the men of that place, Hey, where's the harlot? Where's the harlot that uh, was openly sitting by the wayside here? There wasn't any harlot in this place, they said, verse 22. And he returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. Uh, the men said there never was a harlot there. And Judah said in verse 23, well, let her, uh, uh, let her take it to her, 
lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent the kid, and we haven't found her. In other words, I did my best, and uh, it didn't work. What's going on here in this two-faced part that uh, she has in it is in uh, impersonation. In those verses, she lured him by impersonating a harlot. She lures him into her trap. She disguises herself. She makes a deal with him, and then the deed is done through her impersonation. So they're self-willed. There's two-faced. Let's pick it up in verse 24 and 26. And uh, here's where we see red-handed, caught red-handed. Look at verse 24 of uh, chapter 38. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she's with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By this man, whose these are, am I with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, Whose are these? The signet, the bracelets, and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shilam my son, and he knew her again no more, had no more relation with her. Caught red-handed. You would think he would get buy, get a pass, right? No. Can I say this? Listen to me. No one gets a pass. You might think you do, and you might think other people do. You might think there is, uh, there, there may actually be two-tier justice systems in countries, but no one gets by. No one gets a pass in the end. God is the judge. And he will see to it that justice will be done. He will see to it, as Moses said to the tribes of Gad and Manasseh and Reuben, be sure your sin will find you out. It will. If we're doing things secretly and we think no one will ever find out about it, guess what? Be sure your sin will find you out. Let that play in your mind. Let that remain there. Be sure your sin will find you out. You will not get by with it ultimately. Eventually in time it will be known and everyone will know it. Red-handed, he's caught here. And there's condemnation uh, in that 24th verse on the part of uh, Judah. Tamar is found out to be three months pregnant and he immediately demands the death penalty for her adultery. It's interesting how guilty people always seem to overcompensate for other people's sin. Harsh in his judgment of her because he knew how guilty he was. She should have been, if killed at all, stoned, but he said, no, burn her. Condemnation. Well, that condemnation very quickly in the next two verses, 25 and 26, turns to conviction. And Judah is absolutely shocked, I'll guarantee you. Tamar, very clever, but here seems to be very meek. She meekly produces the evidence of Judah's guilt. And his guilt is twice her guilt because he refused to give her his son as, as uh, was necessary and promised. And then secondly, he was involved in whoredom, as uh, we just saw. So he's doubly guilty. There's conviction here. And you see it when he does speak. And uh, he says in that uh, 26th verse, she hath been more righteous than I because I gave her not to Sheila, Sheila, my son. There is an admission on his part here. 
She is more in the right than I am. She, she got her right of a son while he refused to give his son to her. She is more right than I am. I wish that that was repentance on his part, but I don't read it like that. I think he's just stating a fact. Oh, she won, I lost. Last thing I want to share with you is the last four verses of the chapter. I call it breakthrough. Verse 27 to verse 30. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. Now, when was the last time we saw twins born in the book of Genesis? Yeah. Jacob and Esau, right? And wasn't there struggling in the womb of Rebecca when she was carrying those two boys? And she was mystified by it and perplexed. And Lord, what's going on? What's, it's like there's a battle going on. In, too much movement. Well, look at what it says here, verse 28. And it came to pass when she travailed, the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, this one came out first. Okay? She wanted to mark the firstborn with that scarlet thread. But notice what happens here. Verse 29. It came to pass as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out. And the midwife said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Faraz, which means forging through or breaking through. Breach. Forging through or breaking through. So Tamar deceptively won the right to be the mother of Judah's heir and firstborn. And these final verses here really are the significant part of the whole account. God gave Tamar twins, and the line of Judah, the line of Judah continues because of this woman, because of Tamar. And this firstborn, Perez, this forger through, this breakthrough that he is born as a result of, he is another picture of God's choice. The elder shall serve the younger. The other one was supposed to come out first. He had the cord on his arm, right? The string, the scarlet thread on his arm. But instead, the younger one comes out first. And he becomes the one that God chooses. And do you know that this man, Perez, he is he's listed in the line of David. In Ruth chapter 4 and verse 18, he's listed in the line of David, which of course means that he also is listed in the line of Messiah. Now listen to this. This is Matthew chapter 1. When you open the Gospels and you read Matthew, the first chapter, you have the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, one of them. And it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Messiah. That's what it says in Genesis 1.1. Remember Genesis 37.2, the generation of Jacob. Here, the generation of Jesus Messiah. Notice, the son of David the son of Abraham, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah, Judas, and his brethren. And Judas begat, here it is, Perez, and Zerah of Thamar. And Perez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nasan, and Nasan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. You know what's interesting about Matthew's genealogy? There are four women in it not counting Mary, there are four women in that genealogy. And uh, 
three of those women are sinful women. Two of them are prostitutes or practice prostitution. There's Rahab. There's also here Tamar. Three of them are, a uh, couple of them are also Gentiles. Bad reputations. What do, you, what do you take away from that? Well, obviously it is a demonstration of grace and that salvation is to all, redemption is for all, but I think it's also telling us that while human nature is sinful, God is holy, but his grace reaches to all. The well-known writer, Ernest Hemingway, did you know that he was raised in a solid Christian home in Oak Park, Illinois? In fact, he had very godly grandparents. They went to the Christian uh, college, Wheaton College. His grandfather, Arson Hemingway, shared a close relationship with evangelist D.L. Moody. Ernest physician father had wanted to be a missionary doctor, but his wife, his wife did not want to leave the city, and she refused to go. So Ernest was raised in the church where he was taught to tithe his allowance. He sang in the church choir. He read completely through the Bible, and he passed a comprehensive test on it. But after high school, he moved to Kansas City. He wanted to become a reporter. So he stopped going to church when he moved away from home. And he began drinking. He began drifting from his upbringing. And he enlisted in World War I and was wounded in World War I. And as a result, he really began, began to depend upon alcohol to help him with the pain. He married a worldly woman and ended up moving to Paris farther away from his family, and he was totally alienated from his parents, and eventually he would be married four times. He was notorious for his drunkenness. In his late years, he said, and I quote, he grew distant, uh, I grew distant from everyone and stopped communicating verbally. A friend said that his every hour was filled with pain of being truly lost and alone. Hemingway's own description was, quote, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as, you may not understand this terminology, but try it. I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there is no current to plug into, unquote. Finally, on a sunny Sunday morning in, at the age of 61 in Idaho, Ernest Hemingway put a shotgun to his head and pulled the trigger. His tragic life didn't have to go in that direction. He made some bad choices. He distanced himself from the Lord. He distanced himself from God's people. He married an unbeliever. He conformed to the corrupt world. He could have availed himself of God's grace and, and, and would have been saved, but Instead, he chose a different path. His children and his grandchildren could have followed a godly uh, father and grandfather. Instead, he had a supermodel granddaughter who committed suicide in 1996 at the age of 42. And as far as we know, all his descendants are very far from the Lord. You know, it's amazing. Again, it's just the grace of God that he can take a family like Jacob's and anything good can come out of it. But that should give us hope. Our choices are very important because it not only impacts us, but our descendants as well. And I'm afraid that we are going, as I have experienced, we are going to live to regret some of the choices that we've made in life. but they can be redeemable. Perez, his name means breakthrough. 
there can be a redeeming breakthrough in your life and in your family. Just as God broke through all of that ugliness of this chapter, all of the sinfulness that is recorded here, and brought out of that line a Messiah, there is no one and nothing that is not redeemable. There is hope for us. God can do what we could never imagine if you let him. We'll look to him. Let's pray. Lord, there may be folks that have never truly come into a genuine saving relationship with you. They might be here in person. They might be listening online at this time or at some other time. But Lord, I pray because I believe that the gospel is your power unto salvation. I pray that the gospel message of a Savior, Jesus the Messiah, who came to die in our place for our sin, would be believed, and that folks would be converted and would be saved as a result. And I pray for those of us that know you as Savior, but perhaps we have had lapses and uh, we have turned away and made foolish and very wrong choices in our life that has impacted not only us, but others that we love. I pray that you would give us hope today, that we would see the redeeming grace and power of God in our lives as we got a glimpse of in the life of the family of Judah. Lord, we're undeserving, all of us. We're no better than they. We're all undeserving. But Lord, you are able and you came for that purpose because we are totally helpless without you. And so we are this morning placing ourselves at your feet, as it were, and saying, oh God, have mercy upon me. And Lord, based upon what you've promised, save me. And Lord, redeem me as far as the choices that I've made that have brought me farther from you. Lord, please bring me back. I give myself to you today. As we close in prayer, if there is anyone here that needs to settle something with the Lord, if we can help you, be glad to speak with you after we close in prayer. Be glad to pray with you for anything that is on your heart. Any way that we can help you, please let us do so. Heavenly Father, again, we commit it to you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.